Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. We're going to be finishing off the book of Hebrews tonight. Uh, we're just finishing off the end of chapter 13 as we come together to look at this. So as we start, let us pause and let's start off with, uh, by talking to God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you as we come now to, to look at your word. We thank you for the day that has gone by. We thank you for um, all that you have done for us this day, all that you've provided us with. And Lord, as we, as we come now to look at your words, we just pray that you would help to still our hearts, that you would help us to set aside the busyness of the day so that we can concentrate upon you. Lord, for so many of us, we, we spend a lot of time in front of the screens these days and it is tiring. So Lord, may this be a time of refreshment. May this be a time that we can just listen and just know you with us. To know the peace of your presence. To know your blessing of your presence. Just to know your hand upon us. So Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it shows us, what it teaches us, how it directs us. Help us now to hear it with fresh ears. To understand it with um, fresh understanding that it be alive to us this evening. Come now, Father, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let me read to you um, these verses. This is the end of Hebrews chapter 13. I'll start to read from verse 17, which is where we left off last week, just down to the end. So let's hear what it says. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Pray for us, for our conscience is clear and we want to live honourably in everything we do. And especially pray that I will be able to come back to you soon. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to pay attention to what I have written in this brief exhortation. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released from jail. If he comes here soon, I will bring him with me to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the believers there. The believers from Italy send their greetings. May God's grace be with you all. Amen. And that's the end of Hebrews chapter 13. We left off last week at verse 17 talking about how people watch what we do. Um, it says about obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Um, you know, we live in a world of observation. So everyone watches us. So we are called to, to watch our spiritual leaders, but remembering as well that others are watching us and our actions. Uh, but look what else it says there. Their work is to watch over your souls. They are accountable to God. You know, there's a great burden upon those of us who are called to teach because we do have the responsibility of teaching to, to help others understand and ultimately to help others turn to God in faith. Uh, and we are accountable to God uh, as to whether we have done that faithfully or not. And, and that, that is difficult. Um, or it, it's not as difficult. It, it's, it's, it, puts a, it does put a burden on you and makes you very aware of what you're doing. Um, and yeah, and that's, it's an important work to do. It says, um, in relation to teachers, give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. You know, the writer wants teachers to do it with joy. So it's, it's seeing people respond. It's having people communicate with you. It's having people engage with you um, and seeing them grow. And that's what gives teachers joy. But the, the, the greatest joy of all, of course, is seeing somebody come into faith in the Lord and seeing God transform their lives and knowing that that's not the teacher and what they've done, but that's the work of God. I, I, you know, for all of us here teachers, it is that recognition that we don't do this in our strength, but we do it in God's strength. Um, 
but we need help with that and that's why the writer writes this next verse and that it's so important. It says, pray for us, for our conscience is clear and we want to live honourably in everything we do. Pray for us. Those three words, three simple words, but three words which mean so much to somebody who teaches and also places a big responsibility on everybody else's shoulders as well. The writer is asking those who are listening to this to pray for him, to pray that what he does is done right and done in the right way and for the right reasons. Uh, and you know, that, that, that is a big responsibility. It's, it's not a new responsibility. It's not something which comes as groundbreaking or shocking. It, time and time again in the New Testament, we are told to pray for each other. Um, another example would be Ephesians 6, 18. If you think of the, the passage in Ephesians talking about the armour of God, um, in verse 18 it says there, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. We're called to pray for each other. So we're called to pray for our brother and sisters who sit next to us in church or who live next door to us, who are in our town, who are in our land, but also our brothers and sisters who are right the way around the world. And this particular plea for prayer is from a teacher to, to pray for the teachers that um, they would be able to teach and teach clearly and teach concisely. Uh, and, and the, the person who writes it is very definite in what they're doing. It says, for our conscience is clear. So the person who writes this is certain that what they are saying and writing is true and that it is from God, but then it's how it's received. And, and it's for their strength as they continue to do that. And that's an important part of what we all do. Pray for one another. You know, we, we meet for prayer time in church. And as we do that, we think about those in church who maybe are not well, who face trials and tribulations, who face difficulties. And we pray for each other. We also give thanks for answered prayer. And, 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 and we come and we praise God for that. And we thank him for it. And that's a joy to be able to do that. If you've never been to one of our times of prayer, I would encourage you, please, to come along. You don't have to pray at it out loud. You can, you can simply sit and listen to the prayers of others. You can, you can listen to what we pray. And the prayers are simple, and, but the prayers are from the heart and the prayers are to God. At the end of the day, it's, it's a time of, of conversation together with God. And that's what, the prayer, what prayer is all about. Pray for us. I know certainly from my point of view within church here, I, I couldn't do what I do without your prayers. And I do feel carried by your prayers and, and I am very aware, and as a family, we are very aware of your prayers for us and we thank you for that. Um, and we would ask you to keep on praying for us just as we keep on praying for you as well. That's what carries us all through. The writer here says, I especially pray that I will be able to come back to you sin. So this writer has been with these people before. This writer has already met them and he's writing from a place of understanding or a place of friendship, a place where he knows what they're going through, which again makes this letter more personal. It's not that he's just heard about the people and decides to write to them, um, but he knows them personally and he's addressing issues that he, he has first-hand experience of with them and trying to encourage them from that point of view. You know, we all want to be back together again soon, don't we? We all want to be um, actually seeing one another because we know how much of an encouragement that is to do that. And we know how much we miss seeing one another. This is a harder time than what we have. This is a time whenever communication is by letter. It's not even a phone call. Uh, it's not as if you could just, you know, phone somebody. Where we have so many means of communication now, even in this lockdown, between phone and computer and email and Zoom. I mean, every, every method that you could think of. So if we think how difficult it is for us, think how this writer must feel whenever he can only write to these people and can't actually be with them. That might give us a little bit of a hint of who possibly might have written this letter. 
uh, and we get another little hint a bit later on as well. Um, but it's only a hint, it's not definite, but maybe it helps us to see things a bit clearer. But then look at what the writer says. Now may the God of peace, you know, it's wonderful, a God of peace, a God who wants peace in this world. That, that, that's what God wants. God doesn't want the conflict. He doesn't want the sin. He doesn't want the bickering and the fighting, which we see uh, between human beings all the time. God wants us to live in peace, peace with one another, but more importantly, peace with him. And yet we don't have that, do we? So much of our world doesn't have that peace because so much of our world does not accept Jesus for who he is. The writer says, "May now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. The writer's reminding us of what he's already said about Jesus being the one who pays the price for us. Jesus being the, the ultimate high priest, the best high priest, the only high priest who can pay the price with his own blood. The only high priest who once he offers that sacrifice, it's done, that's it, for all time. Doesn't have to be offered again. Sins are forgiven. It says, may he, that is God, equip you with all you need for doing his will. The writer really wants to see these people following God, really wants to see these people doing everything that God has called them to do, that they can do his will. Not that it's half-hearted, but that they can do it all. May he equip you with all that you need. You know, when you think of any single one of us, we have one or two gifts. And, and we can't do everything. But when we come together as a, as a group, as a body, as a church, as the phrase that we use, then we can bring all our gifts together to serve God so that we can do his will. But it's about coming together. Yeah, I, 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 make, I, I make pleas time and time again about please get involved in church. If there's only one area that you could get involved in, then please do that one area. Because for everybody in church to do one thing would completely transform this place. You think of it, if, if everybody who came through our doors, who calls themselves a member of this church, who calls themselves a Christian, did, got involved in one area and helped out in one area or served in one area, what that would do to the work here, what that, what would that would do for the witness of this church family in the town, what that would do for God, it would be amazing and incredible. And yet so many of us come into church and go again and do nothing. That is a really strong challenge, folks. What can you do? And you can do something. You can do something. It's not a case of, oh, I'm too old or I'm too young or I can't do anything. We can all do something. We just need to ask God to show us what that is and how we can get involved and how we can make a difference in his work. May he, God, equip you with all you need to do his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him for all glory to him forever and ever. Amen. God wants to use you. God wants you to be so much part of what he's doing. So that you can have that joy, that sense of fulfilment, that sense of belonging, rather than a sense of loneliness or abandonment or sitting on the sidelines and not really part of what's going on. God wants you in the centre of it. But that means we've got to get involved. It means we've got to get out of the seat and actually do something. The writer says, I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to pay attention to what I've written in this brief exhortation. In other words, just don't read it and walk away. Read it, digest it, mull it over, think about it, pray about it, and then act on it. You know, it's like elsewhere in the Bible where it says, what good is it if you have a mirror and you look at it and you walk away and you forget what you see? 
you meant to look in the mirror, see what's going on with your face. He says, your hair sticking up, put it back down again. Is there a dirty mark in your face? You clean it. Um, you know, look at what's going on and, and act in that. And it's the same with God's word. Read it. See what it's saying to you. See where it's challenging you. And then just don't close the cover over. But let it come into your heart. Let it change you. Let it transform you. Get involved. Get stuck in with everybody else. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing even on something as simple as a drop-off day down here. Whenever people um, will come along and say, I'll, I'll give you a hand. And just to see the conversations that they have, to see the interaction that goes on, to see the, the effect that that has on others. What about even something as simple as standing on the door and saying hello as people come in and welcoming people, making sure they get to a seat, uh, just making sure they're greeted. That makes such a difference. What about coming along and volunteering at something like toddlers or BB or GB or craft class or bowls? What about being here? Um, if you like, you know, if you like activity, even if it's football and fellowship and doing something like that, what about getting involved? You know, involvement is not about always, it's not asking you to come along and teach. It's asking you to be here. It's asking you to be a friend to others. It's asking you to have a conversation with people. It's maybe asking you to kick a football or throw a ball down the, down the hall. But to be here, to actually talk, to chat, just to be involved, just to be part of it. You know, that, it's transforming. It, it makes such a difference. And I hope that, God willing, as we start to open up again, once this lockdown eases, and as we start to get back into the, the rhythm and the pattern of our activities and the different things that we do, uh, and as we start to get, get that confidence of being here, it would be really exciting if you would come along and get involved. If you would volunteer and say, what's the one thing I can do, right? Let, let me do that. For one, it would help those who are doing five or six different things. And let's face it, who get tired doing that. And it, it is tiring, and it's a lot of running around. So for you to help out would, would take the strain off some folks, but it would also just open up a whole new world to you, the whole world of service and the joy that it brings with it. Just after that, um, the writer says, I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released from jail. If he comes here um, soon, I'll bring him and with me to see you. I wonder, is the writer of this letter Paul? A lot of scholars assume that it is. Some will say, oh no, it's somebody different. But Paul and Timothy had a special relationship. Timothy's in jail, he's come out of jail. This writer's hoping that he'll meet up with Timothy and that they can travel together. Maybe it's Paul. Um, certainly, some of the things that he talks about and how he writes, Paul, Paul would know these things. And Paul has journeyed around this region and has written to many churches, so maybe it is Paul. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is it's here for us to read and to learn from today. And then it says, greet all your leaders and all the believers there. The believers in Italy send you their greetings. May God's grace be with you all. You know, it's just, it's lovely whenever we meet with one another just to say, may God's peace be with you. May God's grace be upon you. And the privilege that we have to pray for one another that way and to be able to share in that, it is a privilege and it is an honour to be able to do that with each other. Let's not forget that honour and that privilege. And as we do start to meet again together, let's continue to pray for one another, to look out for one another, to ask for God's blessing on one another. So let's do that right now. Let's pause and let's pray and ask for God's blessing upon our church family and upon the family right the way around the world. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the challenges that it brings, for the encouragement that it brings, for the peace that it brings us, Lord. But most of all, thank you for the blessing that you bring to us. The blessing of knowing that no matter where we are and what is going on, that you are with us. Lord, we pray for our church family here in Strain. We pray for your peace and blessing to be on each and every one of them. And Lord, for our brothers and sisters in this town, in this land of Ireland, in this part of Europe, and then right the way around the world, 
Lord, we pray again for your peace and your blessing to be on each and every one, that they may know you close, that they may know you near. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word and continue with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining in this evening. And thank you for journeying with us through the book of Hebrews. It's been great to have you as we do that. Um, not quite sure what's going to happen with lockdown over the next few weeks. But um, next Monday, or next Wednesday, sorry, is actually St. Patrick's Day. Uh, and this month actually has five Wednesdays in it. So what we'll do, we'll pause for next week. But the following week, we will have a time of Bible study and prayer together. Uh, and that'll be the fifth um of the of the the, the um the, sorry the, the the fourth um wednesday in the month and then we'll i'll have the fifth one after that so that we'll still be every other week um and we'll we'll, we'll see what's happening with lockdown then with our daily bible readings and with our bible study and we'll keep you informed so in the meantime folks take care and god bless see you soon